Good evening and welcome to the October 9th, 2014 meeting of the Northampton School Committee. Um, for those of you who were not watching the previous meeting, I want to take this opportunity to welcome our newest member of the school committee, the newly appointed uh, representative from Ward 2, Laura Fallon, who's uh, joining us at the table just moments after having been appointed and sworn in. Uh, but I should tell those watching at home that we actually sent the uh, school committee packet to all three of the candidates, knowing that one of them might actually have to sit down and, and begin working with the school committee. So uh, she has had access to all of the same documents that all the other school committee members have had. Um, so welcome, welcome. Um, so I will begin the meeting by asking the clerk to call the roll of the full school committee. Present. 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 Excellent. Um, so now we will move to the public comment period. And uh, our list, we have one person who is uh, signed up in public comment. Uh, and I would ask you to come to the podium, Mr. Whalen, and state your name and address. And uh, you have three minutes. Thank you, Mayor. Hello, my name is Jeremy Whalen of 214 Pomeroy Lane in Amherst. I'm a new hire at the high school for the tech department. Um, I may be a familiar face to some of you. I actually used to work uh, these meetings uh, when I was employed for uh, NCTV. Um, and it's on that note that I would just like to kind of publicly thank Northampton Communi Community Television for their commitment to student learning in Northampton. Uh, Recently, uh, Northampton Community Television, through some collaborations, has uh, donated for this semester over $4,500 worth of camera and equipment uh, to the tech department uh, at, the, uh, high, at the high school. Uh, to give you some perspective, that's five digital SLR cameras, uh, and we currently, before this, had uh, 10 point-and-shoot cameras, which had an estimated retail price of about $30. So we have five new cameras coming in, that are uh, really top quality, and it's a, it's a great privilege for Northampton students to be learning on these. Uh, not only that, uh, there's also uh, upgrading of some computers that were generously donated to us from uh, Smith College. Uh, we're looking at some RAM up upgrades for uh, those computers that will fall in around $800 in donations, as well as uh, Adobe uh, master suite licenses for profes uh, professional post-production uh, in our classes as well, which is going to probably fa fall within the $2,500 range. So all of this happening just at the beginning of the school year. Um, I'm really ec ecstatic about this, and it's really going to bring us to the next level. Uh, and you can already see the enthusiasm on the students' faces that they're not capped by this technology anymore. Uh, we can now push them to succeed and, and, and hit that professional industry standard, uh, which is really, really nice. Um, so I think that Superintendent Provost and Mayor Narkowitz have seen some of the videos that are being uh, output thus far uh, with some of that uh, technology. Also, uh, not only the technology, but the resources. Uh, they offer students that, from my introductory classes that are looking to take that next step more training and it's just right across the hall. So they've really gone above and beyond and I thank them very much uh, for uh, what they're bringing to the table and the uh, commitment that they do for the students. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I also, um, are there any, anyone else here who wishes to speak in public comment? Okay, so to conclude public comment. I also uh, should have mentioned that we also have um, some additional new members uh, joining the school committee, and that is we've had newly appointed student representatives, um, and Jonathan Latender is one of those uh, student representatives, so Jonathan, welcome, um, and Kyle O'Connell is also a student representative as well, correct? Yes. He's uh, not with us this evening, <coughs> but, but welcome to you. Thank you. There'll be a portion in the report later, uh, in the meeting later, for you to deliver that report. Um, 
So we now move into announcements. Are there any announcements by school committee members? <coughs> Ms. Duvall. Yes, um, I'd like to say we had very busy open houses the, again this year. And I want to thank all the parents for taking the time to go in and see what your child's school is all about and see the work that they've been doing. And I know I had a great time visiting the different schools. And I want to thank all the teachers and the parents who, who um, took the time to talk with me. Thank you. Okay. Any other announcements? <coughs> oh, sorry, Ms. Hannah. Um, I'd just like to remind everyone that next Thursday, October 16th, the Prevention Coalition is having an annual retreat at Smith College beginning at 10.30. So beginning what time? Beginning at 10.30 a.m. Uh, there was an email that was sent out to all of us. If anyone's interested in going, um, you need some more information, you can email us. Um, any other announcements? Oh, Ms. Hennessy. Oh, I have one quick one. Um, October 23rd from... 7 to 8.30, there's a forum on high-stakes testing um, that's organized by one of the groups in Northampton. Um, and I can't think of the name of the group, but it's, it's Human, a, Rights. Human Rights Commission. Yes, the Human Rights Commission and the Northampton Public Schools Action Coalition. Where is that forum? That is at Northampton High School from 7 until 8.30. Thank you. Mr. Moore. And uh, very briefly, the uh, JFK PTO is doing electronics recycling this Saturday, <coughs> starting at 9 o'clock. Oh, good. Okay. Excellent. Any other announcements? Okay. Um, so we'll now move into the recommended actions portion of the agenda, and this is our consent agenda. Um, these are a collection of, uh, of items that we the committee votes on uh, by consent. So we have minutes of the Rules and Policy Subcommittee meeting September 10th, 2014. We have our School Committee meeting minutes from September 11th, 2014. We then have two contracts. We have a Strong Corporation, and this is for bus transportation for the NHS ski team. Uh, that's $10,090. And then we have uh, G. Housen, and that's for bottled water and juice products. Uh, and that's a combined contract for NPS and Smith Vocational, uh, not to exceed $24,000. Um, we also have um, a memorandum of agreement between NPS and the Community Preservation Commission with regard to uh, Bridge Street Playground. And then there is uh, several field trip requests. The Leeds fifth grade going to Nature's Classroom in Beckett, November 4th through 7th, 2014. Bridge Street, uh, fifth grade, going to the Connecticut Science Center in Hartford, November 5th. Leeds, third grade, going to Plymouth Plantation, and yes, that is the correct spelling, uh, the traditional uh, colonial spelling, uh, Wampanoag Homestead and Mayflower II in Plymouth, Massachusetts, November 6, 2014. So those are the items on the consent agenda. Um, and unless anyone has any uh, reason to take any items off the consent agenda, I would ask for a motion to approve it. I do. I, I would like to approve um, as standard, except I would like to take off the strong corporation. Okay. Excellent. Any other uh, requests of that nature? Okay. So all those, uh, so if you could make a motion. Oh, I, I move to accept the consent agenda <coughs> minus, minus the, the strong second. corporation. Second. And there's a second. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. So um, uh, if you have a question about that contract. I do. Our, I should also <coughs> mention Ms. Walzak is now officially our business manager. She was here at our last meeting, uh, but as of October 1st, she is now officially the business manager or, or um, uh, finance director. I'm not sure the exact type of administrator. Business administrator. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> um, so go ahead. Well, my question is that it's $10,090 um, for bus transportation, and um, I'm just wondering where that funding is coming from so that it can just be out there for everyone to know where that 10000 came from. Coming out of the athletic revolving account, which is where all of the fees and music fees, gate receipts, and everything go into. So that revolving fund actually funds part of the athletic program along with the school committee appropriation to athletics. Okay. Move to approve the strong corporation contract. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Okay. All those in favor of approving the contract, uh, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. 
So we'll now move into the reports and recommendations portion of the agenda. And the first item is a report from our student representatives. And I will uh, turn the floor over to John. Thank you, Mr. Nar Mayor Narkowitz. <clears throat> this, uh, this year, new events were held at NHS. For the first time ever, there was a ninth grade transition meeting, and it was held um, August 26th at 7 p.m. at NHS. At this, ninth graders were handed their schedules. Parents and students had question, their questions answered. They were handed um, the student handbook and went over some policies as well. We also gave student and parent logins to Aspen, which is our, data, our database system. This means, this means it's the first time NHS has had a parent-student portal, which allows parents to track their kids' academic attendance records, check all of their kids' grades and homework assignments. NHS is currently in the process of signing up all students and parents into Aspen. In September, NHS had their open house on September 18th, and we, we already had the fall fire and bus evacuation drills. The, lock, the lockdown drill is happening soon. NHS has recently hosted the Hampshire County College Fair, where 167 colleges were represented, and hundreds of local students came to get information on their college. The SAT is being held this Saturday, October 11th at NHS, and the PSATs are this coming Wednesday, the 15th. PSATs are mandatory for 10th graders and are offered to 11th graders for all those, are offered to 11th graders. For all those not taking the test, the uh, real class time will start at 1030 for everybody else. Booster week is October 20th to 24th. Booster week is when classes go against each other to earn points. The way you earn points is through cafeteria games, dressing up for theme day, and the pep rally at the end of the week. You can also earn points through the float that your class built. Floats are judged after the booster parade, which is at the end of the week as well. The powder puff game is Tuesday, October 21st. It's uh, juniors versus seniors, and they play flag football, but the roles are switched, where girls play football while their guys cheerlead. Half of the powder puff game um, money is distributed um, in the order that the classes finish during booster week um, with the winning class getting most of that money. Open mic night started up again at NHS. Um, there was a flu clinic held at NHS. Well, there is a flu clinic held for NHS for all students on October 14th during school. If they want to get a flu shot, they have to fill out the form they were handed home um, to bring home. Key Club is holding a big regional meeting on October 25th. It's a regional training conference and is to share ideas for community service projects. The Key Club at NHS currently has about 70 members. And lastly, the f uh, first RSAC meeting, Regional Student Advisory Council meeting, was held October 3rd, and they meet every other month. Thank you. Thank you for that report. Thank mm -hmm. you. Okay, um, we now have a, um, a report from <coughs> Karen Jarvis Vance, and it's an update on the SBIRT screening tool. Good evening. I was asked to come back before you this month after being here last month with the update from the Prevention Coalition as we have uh, several new members who may not have heard about the screening process that takes place at Northampton High School. So I'm just gonna give a quick review of the sort of history and the rationale behind it and then um, take any questions that you might have. That's all right. Um, so we will this year be going into the third year of this screening program. So we have two years now under our belt. We were actually approached by the Department of Public Health um, to be a pilot site for this screening program for problem substance use among our youth. Uh, we were approached because we have a history um, due to the Prevention Coalition work of doing good work in this community and that we were a community that was perhaps ready to try this. Um, the state has a grant from the federal government to implement SBIRT, which stands for Screening, Brief Intervention, and Referral to Treatment in outpatient centers and in hospitals and other medical settings. Um, Boston Medical Center is the, the grantee for that project and they have been doing ESPER in their adolescent outpatient clinics uh, for quite a few years now. Um, as they tried to get it pushed out further into pediatricians' offices, 
um, they were re receiving a lot of pushback because pediatricians, for a few different reasons, not the least being that pediatricians are incredibly busy um, just getting through a well child visit with all the other things that they need to address and that trying to add another screening process, even though it does fit the definition under the Rosie D legislation of a mental health screen, um, they really weren't willing to do that. So um, they were looking for other sites that might work for this and thought of the schools. Um, schools, you know, school nursing started as a public health initiative to reduce absenteeism. And over the years, many different public health initiatives aimed at children are carried out through the schools. So it is a natural fit. We also already screen children for many different things, vision, hearing, scoliosis, height, weight. So this is not out of the ordinary. So um, we volunteered to be a pilot site along with two other districts out east. And we received training from um, Boston Medical Center from the experts there on the technique of um, interviewing used in the screening process called motivational interviewing. And it's a little different way to talk to people in general. It works very well on adults as well as uh, <laughs> children um, about changing their behavior. And what it seeks to do is um, develop a sort of cognitive dissonance, a discrepancy between what you think and believe and what you actually do. And to have you kind of look at that and develop your own reasons and your own motivation for changing your behavior. Because we all know that just saying don't do it does not work. If that were the case, I'm not even going to go there. Um, <laughs> but it does not work. So, um, so the whole nursing staff got trained, even though only the high school nursing staff <coughs> were going to be carrying out the intervention, because it's a really great skill. And some of the other nurses have used it in different ways in their offices with all different age children. Um, so what the screening is, and you have a copy of the craft screen. It's a series of questions. <coughs> this is an evidence-based screen. Um, there are a few different evidence-based screens. Um, this was the one that's been tested the most on adolescents of the high school age range. Um, it was actually developed by a researcher at Boston Children's Hospital, Dr. John Knight. Um, I met Dr. Knight at a conference and got, was able to speak to him. Um, and he was the one that convinced us we were going to do a verbal interview and ask the students these questions. And he, through his research, had de uh, decided that a paper screen was actually much more effective because of the greater risk of uh, <coughs> greater perception of anonymity. Just filling it out on paper. Um, and it's all about perception. Um, so what happens is before the screening starts, we send letters home to parents to let them know that the screening is going to happen and that we're going to be talking to their students about substance use. We chose to do the screening in the ninth grade because our data, and this is all data driven, this is, uh, ESPER is a recognized strategy of national drug control. Um, the Surgeon General, it's a, it's a recognized, very effective strategy to reduce substance use and problem substance use. Um, <coughs> we decided to work with our ninth graders because we know from our data that the greatest jump in substance use have, occurs between eighth and tenth grade. Um, and ninth grade is also a really tricky transition time for a lot of adolescents. So we decided to screen in ninth grade. Letters went home to parents ahead of time to let them know about the screen and giving them the option to opt their child out as they have with any other screening that we do. Um, and we also sent home a copy of the screen itself so they could actually see what their children were going to be asked. And what was really neat is um, quite a few kids actually came in with the screen already filled out, <laughs> saying my mom or my dad told me to do it, which was great. Um, we received another surprise. I expected that perhaps a lot of parents would choose to opt their children out of the <coughs> screening. Um, but in fact, out of 200 and I think 28 freshmen, 229 freshmen the first year we did it, seven were opted out. And we didn't even um, keep track of which screen they were opting out of. So it's mo probably more likely they were opting out of scoliosis than the craft screening. The second year, I actually had a parent call and tell me, I am opting my child out of every other screen except for this one, which was really awesome. 
Um, so what happens is uh, when we do the screening anyway, because we combine uh, postural screening, height, weight, vision, and hearing all in the end of ninth grade, and the nurse, so the nurse already has the student in the room for a, a good chunk of time doing that. Any of you that has an adolescent in your home knows that the best conversations, right, happen when you're driving or through text messaging so they don't have to actually look at you in the face. Um, and so this was another reason why we decided to do it this way. First, it normalizes it. It's part of general health care. We're going to check your eyes, check your back, and we're going to ask you about <coughs> drugs and alcohol. And the other part of it is while we're busy doing all the other screens, we're carrying on a conversation and it's, it's much more natural for us and for the student. <coughs> um, so they come down a couple at a time. They're handed the paper screen, never together. We don't want them comparing notes. Um, and then they're taken in and we go through the screen with them and we talk to them about their answers on, on the screen. Um, the thing I really want to stress about this is that although we do have made a few referrals and not a lot, the first year we made four referrals to our um, in-school adjustment counselor, the second year one referral. So although we can make referrals for students that we're worried about, we know from our data that by and large most ninth graders are not using substances and we certainly hope that they're not using them to the extent that they'll score a positive on the screen. Um, but what it is is a great opportunity to start a conversation with a trusted adult in a school building um, that they can continue having a trusting relationship with for four, three more years. Um, and the conversations are <coughs> wonderful. I did some of the screens just to see what it was like. And um, I have to tell you, those conversations were really uh, enlightening, I think, for both the screener and the student being screened. I learned that a lot of students um, really are having great conversations with their parents about planning and about having a plan for if they get into a tough situation. Um, most of the time, when they answer the first part of the screen about their use, if they haven't used, they only have to answer the first question about riding in cars with people that are under the influence. Most of the conversations we had were about that question and about strategizing for the future if it hadn't happened. Um, if kids did um, not have any substance use, I was asking the staff to ask them how that's been for them, how they managed to do that, and we got some great information from that too about how kids are choosing not to use and what strategies they use if they're um, approached. Um, and let's see. I gave you a handout with the results from the first year and the second year, so you can kind of look over that. They look very, very, very similar. Um, like I said, we screened a large number of students and only referred a very, very small amount. Um, we also decided to do a post-test. Um, I was in the copy room in the high school, and a, a parent that also happens to be a teacher said, you know, she noticed something interesting about her child that, um, this, her child had never before gone to see the school nurse. Entire schooling career had never gone to see the school nurse and recently had gone for an issue that normally would not have gone for. And she wondered if perhaps um, having this conversation with the nurse and learning that the nurse is somebody you can go to if you have a problem maybe changed their perception. So I did a post um, survey <coughs> with the students basically asking them if they would be more likely to use the nurse's office or talk to somebody else about substance use, or and if they thought they would be more or less likely to use um, substances in the future. And I also asked them the, the best question, which I get all the time, were you honest? And so we know from <laughs> research that by and large, um, on surveys, adolescents are honest. Um, when you ask them at the end of a survey, were you honest, they answer that question honestly. <laughs> and if they answer no, then that survey is thrown out. Um, we also know that usually if an adolescent chooses to tell you something, it's because they want you to know. Um, so the, the best part about the post-test was a, a significantly large number of our students said that they would be less likely to use substances in the future after going through the screening. And almost 90% said they were honest with the, 
with the screener, which is great. Um, and so that's pretty much all I have about what we've done so far. This year we'll be going into our third year. And I'm also up here tonight. I included a, a different screen that can be used for the middle school age students because we would like to extend the screening into eighth grade. It's a much simpler two question screen that first asks them about their friends and if they're concerned about any of their friends because that's a great way to kind of start a conversation with a middle school age child. And then we ask them about their own use. And that's it, very, very simple. Um, using the same techniques that we learned um, to do the screening for the high school age students. So that's something that we're hoping to start this year because we know that <coughs> most of our students are not using in eighth grade, but a significant portion have tried substances. So I'm now open to any, I think I've done the quick and dirty. Ms. Minnick. Hypothetically, I have a friend who, no. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'm curious, after you've done these, these screenings and you've talked to kids and you found out how they were able to resist <coughs> getting mm -hmm. involved with drugs, or you found out what their parents have spoken to them about and mm -hmm. that, that helped make those, have you considered compiling a list mm -hmm. and we did that? <laughs> and we actually, well, what we did is we used it in future screenings. So when we're talking to kids about that, we're actually able to say, well, you know, a number of your classmates say that they use this strategy. Is it something that would work as a tool for parents? I guess that's where I was going. Or, or others who, I mean. Perhaps, I mean, others. that's part of our social norms campaign too yeah. for parents that I mean, we, if we do. strategies that will help, and mm -hmm. frankly, just the, tr the training that you went through that teaches you how to conduct the expert Yes, that is a very good point. Is it possible that you can share some of this, how to talk with your kid and yes. what questions or what suggestions and strategies to mention? I actually have it in my email inbox, uh, motivational <coughs> interviewing training for parents that I'm going to review and perhaps post up on our, our website and then direct, be able to direct parents to it. Because it is, I've used it on my own kids and it's amazing the information that you can get from them and the real conversation, not like I'm talking and there's a stone wall there, um, that you can get because it's so non judgmental and open ended. Yes? Um, can you just tell me what's the confidentiality, uh, confidentiality policy regarding mm -hmm. that? At what point do you notify parents if there's a true problem? Yes, it's, very, it's laid out all in our protocol, but what we say to the students when they come in right off the bat, this is a confidential screen. The results will not be shared unless we feel that you're at risk to yourself or to somebody else. So they know right off, and if we feel that, then we will have you see a, a guidance counselor and we will call your parent. And so the four that we had to refer the first year, we did call the parents. And those calls all actually went well. <coughs> the student seemed relieved, the parents were happy to have the information. We've not had a negative outcome yet. We do not record this in their health record. Um, we only, we keep aggregate data for the state without any identifiers on it and that's it. And then um, if a nurse needs to keep a note of something so that she can refer back later, she can keep that in her personal notes. It's not part of the student's health record. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for welcome. this update. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, uh, we actually have two items. Uh, the next two items um, involve a gift and the need for the city count, uh, the school committee to take a vote to accept the gift. Um, and uh, the first is for basketballs and wall balls for Bridge Street School Playground, and the other is the Bridge Street School Playground <coughs> Equipment Storage Shed. And uh, I will turn to uh, Ms. Walzak to uh, explain those. Okay, we're very fortunate that both of these gifts actually come from the same family. Um, it's a family that has kids in the school. The principal will be acknowledging the family directly and letting the school community there know who the family was, but it, it has worked out very well that this family's come forward and been willing to support the efforts going into the new playground. The playground balls and wall, basketballs and wall balls will actually be used on the playground. 
and then the shed she said what's actually going to go in is a 10 by 16 shed that will allow them to store a lot of the loose equipment that will be used out in the playground so they'll have a secure place the shed will be getting installed by the company it's being purchased from it does have a value in excess of three thousand dollars for the shed so it's a pretty substantial donation that we're fortunate to get from the family um, Mr. And I, I believe they're having sort of a formal ceremony um, next Friday, October 17th, to sort of open a ribbon cutting on this new playground. But if you have a chance to, even if you don't go then, just to drive by and see it and try to remember the variously dust bowl or mud pit that was the playground at uh, Bridge Street School, you, you should, because it's, uh, it's quite spectacular. It was like your Kansas youth, right? In, in the good old days, yes. <laughs> 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 okay, um, any other questions or comments about this vote? Okay, hearing none then, I would accept a motion. I'd like to make a motion to accept the gifts of the basketballs and wall balls for the, um, uh, Bridge Street School. And we have to take two separate votes. We could do this. Okay, separately. and yeah. for the playground equipment storage shed. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Okay, any further discussion on these items? Okay. With here. great thanks. With great thanks. With great <laughs> thanks in that, please, Laura. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. So, again, thank you for those uh, generous gifts to Bridge Street School. The next item on the agenda is a presentation by the high school principal, Mr. Lombardi, on our AP test results. Good evening. Nice to be here. If I get to see many of you in a while, <coughs> um, nice to see you finally. So I think since last maybe spring, it's the last time I've been here. So I'm here to present um, last year's 2013-2014 um, AP results. Um, last year, out of school, pro approximately 905, seven, I think 907 last year was the end census, we, gave, we have 313 students taking AP classes. For those 313 students taking AP classes, we administered 628 AP exams. Out of those exams, 173, 28% scored a five which is the highest score you want. Um, 180, 29% um, a four, and 141 was a three. So 79% of our exams of the 628 were scores of three or higher, which is what you want to achieve for the college level. Um, and then the remaining 21% were two or, two or one. <laughs> um, I can go by, we, we continue to excel in the sciences um, and the Englishes. Um, again, every, all our categories are threes or hires. Um, a highlight for uh, foreign language, for example, no score was below a three. Um, so again, our teachers, our students are performing very high. Um, I'm very pleased with that, th of our offerings. When you have a third, of, possibly a third of our school taking AP classes and administering 628 exams, I think this says a lot about um, the rigor of our classes and the desire for our students to um, challenge themselves. Are there any questions uh, for Mr. Lombardi about our AT? P results. This is a real fine distinction, but clearly some of your students are performing well. But I wonder if you have asked them if they believe that their classes are preparing them or if they're just generally smart kids. You know what I'm saying? I, do yeah. they feel you know, that the, that the you know, that's, you know, curriculum is serving them? What we don't do at them. Northampton, I think would be a great thing, would be to do an after graduation um, survey. That's, that's when you get that data. Um, typically, that would say in unofficial surveys, when I hear from students <coughs> that come back, they say they were very prepared. Um, they definitely feel they, um, in terms of the language, for our science classes, in terms of the lab reports, how you write lab reports, the feedback that we get verbally, again, non-officially, is very prepared. Okay. But again, but that's a, that, I think that's a great thing, which helps you then, I think, guide your practice, what your instruction. Um, but that would be, what you, how you'd get that would be to have some survey afterwards to um, freshmen, sophomores, uh, the university they are, and ask them how did they do? Um, were they prepared for the upper level classes? Um, AP should be an entry level biology, science, foreign language class at a college level. So you'd want to see, you know, again, how do they, how do they fare at that point? Okay. Go ahead, Ms. Uh, small question. Do you have many students Ish, taking an AP exam without the course, and if so, is it science? Um, no, we 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 give so many exams, yeah. 628, yeah. that we start, started saying we're only going to offer exams of cl classes that we offer. Okay. Um, it was becoming too cumbersome. The paperwork, finding a proctor again when we, school's in session. Yeah. 
you know, so doing 628, 313 kids, um, then trying to find, you know, separate locations for all these things, we felt, you know, we're just going to focus on okay. the classes that we strictly offer. Okay, thanks. Yeah. With the MIMSI grant not, uh, no longer <coughs> in place, uh, have you seen a reduction in the amount of students taking AP? And if not, do you think that the reason uh, that it hasn't decreased is that there's a there's a culture now at the high school where students feel like AP is part of where they should be uh, taking academics. Yeah, I mean there's always, there's always a challenge of, of um, like this past year we did we didn't run to two AP, um, one AP class AP U.S. History um, and you're trying you know trying to find where are the trends what are students looking for so for history for example. Um, they had added an honors U.S. history. Um, so those students, we believe, instead of doing AP, went to U.S. And we find a lot of, again, 313 students are, are taking primarily, you know, the bulk of our AP classes. Well, they're taking the AP classes. When you give 628 exams, it tells you that some kids are taking two, sometimes three AP classes. Um, we've added AP psychology. So I think that we are seeing it, it's kind of leveled off, and sometimes our numbers can support maybe adding something, and if you add another rigorous course like an honors, they might drive there. Um, what feeds that might be, for example, that some, most, a lot of our AP classes are year long, so a student has to make <coughs> a choice. Okay, I want to take an AP chemistry, I want to take an um, AP Spanish. Well, out of a schedule of eight classes, that's half your schedule. You know, so, so it begins to kind of, it might not necessarily be the AP. Definitely we have the rigor. Definitely we have students that want that. Again, we added AP psychology um, last year, or two years ago, I think. Um, but it's also the, the schedule they have that might then, might not have the numbers for another class. So, it, so it's a fine line between that. Um, I know I'm kind of being vague here, but I think, you know, we have not seen a decline in our AP. We've added classes for it. Um, in some classes, based on popularity will run every other year. AP European, for example, will run every other year typically. It didn't run last year, it ran this year. Um, we're going to take a look at our AP US history and see was that an impact of offering honors? Because then a kid might, a student might say, I want the rigor of an honors class, but that's one semester, that now frees me up to take an AP of two semester or access, you know, a higher level elective or Smith class. So there's a lot of variables that students have to think about when they make, choose their schedule. I'm just going to ask, there was a, you know, I think the Boston Globe magazine did a story, I don't even know when, it was a while back, mm -hmm. sort of t talking a little bit about the kind of the, a the proliferation of AP and, and the fact that, you know, what used to be, you know, be a few classes, now it's sort of become the expected, you know, the, the bar has been raised. Sure. So, <coughs> you know, there's a kid that lives in my house who's taking three out of her four classes this, this semester or AP classes, which I, you know, some trepidation about that because I, and I just wonder what's the feedback you get from colleges? Is that really now the new expected norm that you, if you don't take all AP, you know, if you don't have a large collection of AP classes and AP scores that that's going to affect their each, sc each, sc each school keeps a profile. <coughs> so, so students aren't penalized if they have less AP if their school doesn't offer it. Mm -hmm. Um, so they're, they're, they're judging each student for where they're coming from on their own merits and what's available at that, at that school. Um, so if a student came from a Hampshire regional and they might not have as many APs as us, um, if they had less on their transcript, wouldn't be viewed less than ours. Um, some colleges use a, a weight system. They, appoint, they apply points for AP, um, a weight for honors. Um, but we're also hearing that not all um, you know, that you're not getting maybe that, so I think you used to think you'd get a credit and, and you're not getting that um, as much we're hearing. No. But I would also say that, you know, um, <coughs> I went to an administrator's conference this, this um, summer. You know, one of the things, and you, you mentioned your, um, your daughter, someone in your household is taking, what, three APs, four, three? It's a very rigorous, you know, challenging schedule. And I, th and I think somewhere along the line, it's definitely important to have the rigor. Um, but I think it's also important to realize that um, high school experience is also more than just AP. You know, and one of the biggest things that came out of this conference was mentioning to the um, Department of Education was administrators' concerns across the state of the welfare of our students, of, of their emotional mental health. That, that there is an exorbitant amount of pressure being put on them in schools. With, you know, again, their number one thing, he's giving his spiel to us about PARC and MCAS. 
you know, re really heady stuff, really important. But the number one thing that uh, out of the 300 plus um, high schools um, in the state, what they wanted him to hear is the concern about that we're facing with the, the mental health, emotional status of our students. And I think sometimes tied in there is this pressure, this pressure. And, and we have students, plenty of students that think I need that, I need that course of three, three APs. And I think sometimes we miss that, you know, high school, this is more than just, it's without a doubt rigor, but it's also a lot of development socially and emotionally. And I think that's important to keep as we're looking at this as well. I was going to ask, we have someone who's, who's I was going to say, we're admission. very carefully trained. You would never say how many AP classes did you take. It's always, did you take advantage of the AP and honor classes that were available? And yeah. depending on the answer, it's why or why not? Because why not is usually a really, it's a much more informative answer than, than yes, I did. A lot of times students will say, you know, I really wanted to take that AP class, but I'm passionate about art, and that's the only time that art class was offered. And that, to me, is more important information and shows that they have bigger picture and priorities and they're following their passion. So I, I think it's pretty safe to say that no one's tallying up the number of AP classes they take. It's really a big picture scenario and it's based on what are you offering and, you know. I think that was the concern of that Boston Globe article was that, that very issue you raised about kids <coughs> feeling stressed out. And right, and that the more you offer, the more you're expected to take yeah, advantage so. of it. I mean, we want to offer a lot for students that have interests without a doubt, but as you're saying, we're not offering a lot that, with the intention of you must take every one. You know, the, the hope is that if you want to go high and, high and far in science or foreign language, you, you have that path, but we also want to make sure that we have other interests from art for, to music to um, rigorous electives. You know, I, I think when we all went to college, some of the best classes we took were probably the electives after you got um, out of your general um, graduation requirements. And I think that's something that, you know, can be just as stimulating, just as rigorous for our students, you know, um, moving ahead. Some interest, some passion, without a doubt. Other questions about AP? Yeah. Mr. Moore, sorry. Yeah, given, all, given all those concerns about, you know, loading, you know, sort of having a schedule that ends up being loaded with AP classes, how do you, what is the, what's the process for deciding which ones you're going to offer and sort of how, how far out is that plan? In other words, do students know sort of what classes will be offered two years from now? Yeah, you know, that, that's a great question. Um, you know, what students do know is, is, again, they know how many math sciences, you know, the, the, the basic requirements, and what um, Dr. Provost and I are going to touch on that after. So they know generally along their high school career how many more math, science, Englishes they, they need. Um, really what, what drives a schedule are student signups. So we can try to have you know, a, a schedule. We're going to have um, AP US, a, AP Modern Europe, every two years. And, and we want to do that. But y there's trends, there's interest, student bodies change. And every, for example, if I have seven teachers um, in the history department, and every, every teacher equals six sections, I have 42 sections of history to offer. Out of those 42 sections, I need to make <coughs> sure of those 42 sections, they offer the basic modern Europe, US history, the requirements for graduation, uh, my entry level freshman class. <coughs> So what happens, it's a numbers game. We want to offer that AP Euro, but maybe that one year, 16 students sign up. That AP Modern Europe, out of my 42 potential courses, that's two courses for 16 students. And then I have to take a look at the numbers game of, wait a minute, my, eight, my Modern Europe class, if, if I offer eight, those classes are 32. Those are freshman classes coming in. So it, it, it's, you know, um, it's a challenge. What is an appropriate class size to run? Um, how many courses are you going to run of a honors, for example? When we, um, honors US, I don't think that they expected the numbers to go up to be what they were. I think we were expecting to offer maybe two courses. Those numbers were, we needed four sections of the, of the op, um, honors US. So it's really, we can have a rough plan, but it really depends on the signups that we get that drive it, uh, where, where interests are. Other questions for the principal? Okay, well, thank you very much, and don't go far, because I think, uh, <laughs> think you have the, you'll be part of the next presentation. So the next presentation um, in, is, involves Dr. Provost and, and uh, Principal Lombardi, and it is a presentation on Mass Core. And some technology. And some technology, so I'll so, move out of the way. the in-focus projector is heating up.
Oh, that's good, even better. I always feel like it's a little bit I myself by being too prepared. Yeah, yeah. I always feel like weird in this, because I'd like to look at the speakers, but I'd like to look at them showing us. Okay, so <laughs> while the in-focus projector is heating up, let me um, talk about the goal for this, this, this presentation, which is just to um, stimulate some discussion and get direction from the committee um, eventually concerning Mass Core. Um, this is one of the items that is currently on the district's improvement plan. And those of you who are on the evaluation subcommittee know that I have three overarching goals for the year. One is to faithfully execute the existing district improvement plan. The second is to do the entry plan. And the third is to develop a new district improvement plan as a successor for the plan which will be expiring this June. Um, so this item, Mass Core, is, is an element of the current district improvement plan that was scheduled um, to have been begun by this year. Um, from what I've been able to tell, it, there hasn't been, um, there hasn't been a lot of work around it. And so I'm not sure if it's really still um, a a priority for the district. If it is, there's a way to do it, and we, we can talk about that. But before just launching into that, I thought it was important to um, check in on with that. Let me um, also say that uh, some of the slides from this presentation come from a, a DESI presentation on the Mass Corps. Um, you'll be happy to know that their presentation is 30 slides, and we've condensed it down to about 10. But I'll try to point out the ones that are have our own material. So this. Um, first introduction slide is from the, the <coughs> Jesse materials. I don't know how this thing works. Could you advance it, please? <coughs> okay, and this is very difficult to, to read, so I apologize for that, but I'm just um, pointing out this is the current district improvement plan, and we have three items um, that I would say are similar to the Mass Corps in the sense that they're on there and it looks like very little action has been taken on them so far. The Mass Core item is the one that appears in the middle column for faculty and staff, highlighted in yellow. And it talks about an articulated K-12 curriculum that ultimately um, culminates in Mass Core requirements for the high school. So um, moving, moving along to the next slide. So what is Mass Core? Um, this is a recommended program of study for Massachusetts high school students. It's not a mandate. There's no punishment if Northampton chooses not to implement Mass Core. But it really um, was designed from the perspective of sort of backwards planning from college admissions, if you will, and looking at what the dominant admission requirements are for most of the colleges and universities that Massachusetts um, students are applying to and saying, well, if that is one of the potential end goals for our students, then we should have gra graduation requirements that line up with what colleges are expecting so that students don't find themselves um, being denied admission to college because they didn't take the right courses when they were in high school. So um, these are the courses for Mass Core. I'm going to ask Mr. Lombardi if he can do that, because I can't read those from here. OK, sure. <laughs> um, so the Mass Core requirements recommendations are four courses of ELA English, four of mathematics, um, which would include the completion of Algebra II and completion or the completion of the integrated math um, equivalent. Um, all students are also recommended to take a math course um, during their senior year. Um, for science, um, three units of lab-based sciences. Um, coursework taken in technology, engineering may also count um, for the Mass Core Science. Um, the Board of Higher Education um, the admission standards are also um, two lab physical and natural sciences um, will work as well. For history, um, three units including U.S. history and world history. Um, two units of world language, the same language obviously. Um, Physical ed, phys ed um, as required by law. The law is four units. Um, I think we're going to talk about that after, so we'll get into that. Um, one course um, of art, 
I say unit, that's course. Of you know what I'm saying? Um, and then an additional five courses <coughs> to any of the above um, core classes. And then on the bottom they say um, you need a minimum of 22 cra um, credits to graduate from the public school in Massachusetts. Um, also what they're encouraging our students to um, take advanced placement courses, um, capstone or senior project, dual enrollment courses, um, they get the high school and college for college credit, online courses for high school or college credit, um, and um, service learning and or work-based learning. So this um, shows mass core completion rates of Northampton as compared to some of the surrounding communities. Um, some individuals asked if this slide was a mistake. It's not. Um, Northampton has zero <coughs> students completing Mass Core. It's primarily because of the physical education requirement. Um, students need to take four units of phys ed in order to complete Mass Core, and right now they're able to take one. Um, so, the, just out of curiosity, if you took that requirement out, do you have an idea of how many kids are meeting the mass core requirements, except for phys ed? We, we haven't done that analysis, but I would say that it would be much higher. I would guess it would have probably to be much higher than zero, but yeah. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> but I would assume the foreign language would then be the next. Yeah. Yes, it would. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, not a requirement, but. Sure. I'm not. I'm not sure that that answers the question, though. But so I think. I, think I guess maybe my, maybe I'm not understanding the seventy sure. percent of graduates completing mass core. So. Right. So what this graph means is, this is the percentage of graduating seniors in last year's class who fulfilled all of the requirements <coughs> of mass core. So, if you had everything in place except for one of the courses, you are non-completer. Okay. So. Because at Northampton, students aren't able to get the four PE credits, none of them can complete. As you see, the, the completion rates vary at other schools. Other schools are in various stages of implementation of Mass Core. And even if you're in a Mass Core school, you may not have 100% of students complete because you can have some students who have alternate graduation requirements. So um, the Mass Core requires more math now. Yeah. So if we don't have that, then the only people in our class, forgetting about the phys ed program, sure. let's just say that we were in compliance. Sure. So other than that, the only people that would have com completed the mass core would be people who took four years voluntarily That's right. of math and two years voluntarily of foreign language because neither of those are inspected by That's math. right. Okay. And, and typically so the kids at Hampshire Regional that only have 10%, because they're so low up there, 
So those are the kids that just have to be <coughs> that would probably be about what we were, a fluke that the math took, you know, the fourth year of math and though we didn't have to in the foreign language era. I don't know how our kids would compare to them. I do know that our kids, in terms of completing all of the requirements, um, compared just as the chart shows. So there are kids within, within all of the schools who have some parts of Mass Core done, but in order to show up on that chart, you have to have fully completed all of the requirements. We, we, have, wow. we don't offer um, my course offerings for wellness, which is the graduation requirement that we have. Um, we don't have enough staffing to offer courses for a student to take four years. So you don't, there's, it's impossible right now for current staffing requirements for any student to achieve the full mass core expectation because we don't have the staffing to offer um, PE, for example, um, for, four, for four courses worth of credit. Four courses worth of credit over four years would mean that they would have four courses four times they don't have to take it also. So it would only be once a year? Well, I think that's it's well. Just to clarify that, the requirement is that physical education or health be offered every year. It doesn't say that it has to be a full year course or even a half year course. Um, one of the things that you had in your packet were graduation requirements of some of the local surrounding communities. And you'll see that for many of the communities, the PE requirement in junior and senior year in particular is a quarter year credit. So if we were to um, go up to <coughs> the standards, It's the frequency that it appears on the transcript. Okay. It has to be on there every year. So, um, and there's no minimum requirement for how many hours the student has to take. So splitting up a long block into two shorters could do it. Going back to every other day courses could do it. And having, you know, PE run off against another course that's offered every other day would be another way to do it without chewing up the whole block. Okay, and so I have one more question then as far as the art going. Again, does that have time commitment on that? I mean, is it one course or is it like a one full course, the equivalent of one, so that if people wanted to take the one, they could take two halves, it was like a half block, or does, or does time not matter at all there either? My understanding with the art is that it's one course. It can be visual or performing, but it should be one course. The same length of time as an English course or anything right. else? Okay, thank you. Yes. Um, on the Department of Education website that says it's updated as of last week, it, it said that that you're allowed to the school officials have the discretion to offer credit um, for interscholastic yeah. activities and stuff sure. like that in lieu of it. Would, how would that affect our numbers? How many students actually participate in, um, in sports that we could give them credit for having taken? Right, so um, I just received some data from the athletic director on that very question. I think we currently have about 300 student athletes, um, so that would potentially take care of that requirement for those students. Um, it, again, it's not a mandate, but it's an option that the principal has to say, if you're participating in a team sport, you can satisfy the PE requirement through that. It still is a requirement. It's not saying you don't have to do the requirement. It's just saying you're satisfying it in another way. Would that cause problems then with students who are doing, for instance, my daughter does ballet four times a week for six hours a week or whatever. <laughs> Are you yeah. going to be opening a Pandora's box of what is going, is it only interscholastic or can any sort of team sport or individuals? That would be, that, that, that would be discussion and the thought about what, you know, what is in terms of, um, you know, what would the hours, what would the weight be? You know, if, um, if a class, if a PE class, for example, is meeting five times a week, 85 minutes, you could, you know, make a, an argument that, you know, an after school sport is meeting at least that. Um, if a student was doing, you know, a ballet, um, you know, are they doing it equally? So there, there'd have to be something we have to discuss and think about. For example, when, when students do um, internships or work studies, we apply, um, does it equal the amount of time for a class? I yeah. nominate Brian to go assess whether the ballet classes have enough <laughs> rigor. Um, so, 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 so for internships and work studies, we, we expect you know, a certain minimum amount of hours to, to give that weight, that, that rigor. So that would be something we would have to get together. Yeah, it would be foolish for me to say now what it would look like, 
but I think if we were gonna consider things that were not, we were outside of um, a sport to school, we'd have to think, you know, what would be appropriate, you know, what would be the um, way of um, showing that it actually happened, right. you, you know, that type of stuff. You know, you have an internship, have an internship coordinator goes there and reviews things, and, and things like that. Also, question. Can I follow up on that question? Sure. If, um, would it count for the uh, mass court if, we start, if, if the principal or the superintendent, whoever <coughs> would have to make the decision that ballet and this student, little Sally, gets to count that as the phys ed, and it's okay with us, will that, will, will that preclude it from being in, in those rates, the mass court completion rates, because it's the mass court says something differently? Right. If, if we have enabling procedures, then the principal has the authority to, to do that. What would happen is instead of saying ballet on the transcript, it would say PE, probably pass. You know, we'd probably do as a pass fail or something like that. And then the student would get whatever credit we're going to assign in a mass core system to the PE class. Are we considering that anywhere? Because I, I mean, I think that there, it's fraught with problems. So I was just wondering if right. that's a consideration. Well, right now, <laughs> right now we're just talking because. And I guess I'm getting from the discussion tonight that even though this has been on the district improvement plan, this discussion hasn't taken place yet. So it, that's really why I wanted to try to get this out. Ann had a question. Yes. That's okay. Cool. Oh, no, I don't. I have it anymore. Um, Thank you. Oh, I just, so I remember Mass Corps coming up as part of the menu of options that was offered or that, that the district chose to take initiative on as part of our Race to the Top grant. Um, and it was discussed at curriculum committee, and I'm, and I'm just I can't find the minutes from you know that meeting, um, or from the school committee meeting because the minutes aren't on our website anymore. But um, so that was the discussion that I recall, and 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 I did not hear it. You know, it was we talked about the additional language requirements um, at the time. I don't remember a discussion about the fact that we weren't in compliance with state law about physical ed instruction. Um, but there was, I think, uh, Nancy Athis took part in that in that meeting, Mark Prince took part in that meeting and discussed the additional foreign language and you know those additional requirements and the modifications. And at that time, it was seen as a move that you know by the high school administration, it was seen as a move that would not negatively impact and would also help to move our race to the top grant application forward. Thank you for that history. Is are we tied into the race to the top grant? At all anymore? Because I, I thought we started out that financially we are not tied into anything. All, all the money's gone. <laughs> well, we ha we actually still have a small sum of money left over this oh. year, but this is the last year. Yeah. Okay. So if we choose not to implement, we probably chose to. So I'm not understanding why we're doing it again. But actually, other than it just being administratively done, because I thought we had already said that we by August 2014 we should do this. I mean, maybe it was just an objective of, of the meeting, and we haven't. Well, I agree that we shouldn't lightly just undo district improvement plans that we've already voted to implement. One of the things that um, was said during my interviews for this position is we need to have plans and we need to stick to them so that we don't have the chaos of turnover always causing us to start over again. So I think there's a good argument just because it's written, it should be done. However, um, none of the things that would need to have been in place in order to achieve what's on the paper seem like they have been done, which is why we kind of have to back up and say, okay, do we want to change the graduation requirements? Do we want to start building into the budget the positions that would be necessary to teach the additional classes and, and, and having those kinds of discussions? So philosophically we went for it, but as far as financially, we, don't, we haven't back done anything. That's correct. Okay, thank you. Yes. I was just struck by a coincidence of the statistics that um, you know, Mass Corps is supposed to be sort of, if you do this, this is what you need to do in order to be prepared to go to college. And the statewide people, average of people who have completed Mass Corps is roughly the same as our percentage of kids who go to four-year college immediately after graduating from high school, despite the fact that we aren't completing the Mass Corps. <coughs> so, so we are, roughly speaking, our graduates are as ready to go to college as Mass Corps would seem to say, you know, if, if Mass Corps. So clearly, Mass Corps is not the only way to be ready to go to college. Mm -hmm. um, and I, so I think that's another part of it is, you know, okay, so that's one, one sort of somebody's assessment of how you get ready to go to college. But clearly, we are, um, have a lot of kids who are going to college. 
um, and, and in similar numbers to what mass, you know, the mass core completion is. Right. So we're not doing a bad job of getting people ready to go to college. Do, do you to I think we're doing a great job, but there's also 35 percent. You know, and I think we're we're, we're empowered and um, our um, our mandate is to make sure we take a look at all the kids. So yes, six, 65 percent of our kids are going to four-year schools. Without a doubt, 313 kids are taking AP classes. Without a doubt, still 35 percent <coughs> of our population isn't. You know, and I think again when um, Ms. Minnick asked that question, how are they prepared? I think another question we look at though is 35 percent of those kids that don't go to four-year school. If they go to a community college, how are they when they get there? Because a, a lot of feedback we get when kids go to community college, they're doing remedial classes. So again, I think, yes, are we doing good? We should be proud of our 65%. We should be proud of our 313 and our AP scores. But we still have that other 35. We still have one third of our school mm -hmm. that is not going to four year school. One third of a school. And out of that one third, <coughs> what we don't know, are they one third of our graduating class? I'm sorry. One third of that graduating class, we don't know. Are they going to community college? Are they doing military? Are they doing career? And I think that, you know, that's where I think this is kind of also making sure we keep a lens on them so that they have the skills to be successful, have access to a four-year school, or at the very least be, have access and success at a two-year community college that will then, again, um, give them many opportunities. I would like um, to say something. The um, community college. Uh, I just read something in one of the papers or an article somewhere where it was discussing um, that kids would actually be smarter to go to a community college for two years because of financial, get all the requirements out and then transfer over. And I know that Smith College looks very um, highly on the, that program, so does Mount Holyoke and stuff is transferring. So I think, I mean, as far as what the rest of them do, um, to, to not count the two years, I think that that's, you're looking at something different. You're looking at two year kids that are financially maybe less off and they're, they're taking the smart way according to this article or you're looking at kids that really have the dream of wanting to become, wanting to, you know, get the associate's degree and, and have that piece of paper, but struggle. I'd like <coughs> to know the difference, because I do know that a lot of students, because of finances, that do go to the community college for the first two years through the plans of transferring over. Uh, our, um, our rate pretty much in the prison system, you know, pre-push for financial consideration. You know, I think that's right, there's definitely, um, you know, push and awareness that going, going to, and there's been incentives by the state for students to go to um, community college. But, you know, tr there's been a, a long standing, you know, one third of our senior class isn't going there. And again, I, I think it's, I think our guidance would say it, it's, it's not so much about the financial as a piece of it, but there's a greater percentage that those students have not, um, that may have been offered or chosen. Right, and that's what this article was about, was the culture mm -hmm. of whether or not people felt like they had to choose or not choose, not just the financial, and that it was smarter to actually choose that way. And they're trying to change the, the, the framework, the, the pe way people look at a community college for just the people who are struggling. It's not necessarily for just the people who are mm -hmm. struggling, and I do think that, that we need to track those kids that are going to community college and see what it is that we're looking at, because sure. I think that also matters sure. as far as how we do their advanced placement and everything else. It just matters. Sure. How they get into there. That's all. Yeah. I've only been on the job two hours, but my thought on this is, it is, it is a question of access for those thirty-five percent of the students who are not going directly to a four-year college. Even if they end up there by way of a two-year college, they still have to be, meet these requirements to get into that four-year college. Wouldn't it be nice if they didn't have to pay community college prices to do that? They could do it for free at the high school. Or the kid who says, "I don't think I want to go to college," doesn't take that 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 uh, track during school and then realizes after a year at working at a job that they're really not finding fulfilling or particularly well paid, I do want to go to school, they would be ready. They would have those requirements already on their transcripts. I just, I, I feel like that's the part that's kind of key is, is not aligning with Mass Core, which is not required. It's aligning with four year public universities in Massachusetts and their admissions requirements. I think you'd be doing people a favor. Obviously, it comes at a cost. Is, I, I see it as two problems. I see as math is the issue, and that PE is the state requirement, but not the college requirement. Right. Is that right? Well, I would, I'm say, looking I would at you say foreign math. language is probably Yes, I'm sorry, other. foreign language. Right. So I, it seems like the math is a big deal. In 2016, when UMass is going to require that for their entrance, the four years of math. 
Right. So that's correct. Yeah. yeah, I'm, yeah. Okay. And but, I would say, you know, for, for the most part, we have been sort of breaking down the percentages. The students that right now that are going to four-year schools are having at least four years. Right, I, but I guess I, I'm only saying that this looks awful in some respects. Well, the zero is really bad. But <laughs> that the, in some but the PE, which makes us really low, is not a college requirement. That's the state. Right. So that's all I'm saying. That, I, yeah, so that, that's all. It's not as bad as it seems. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So um, can we thank you? So going, going to back to just the, the comparison, um, the, starting with English, that's already aligned. Math would need an additional course as a graduation requirement for Mass Corps. Sciences and social studies are currently aligned as is. Moving on. Um, foreign language we've discussed in the physical education um, we've discussed, and that um, I just want to point out now that that will come out in the CPR. So whether or not we decide to do Mass Corps, we will have to fix PE. Um, arts, and this, this one I guess just sort of surprised me the most, that we don't have any requirement for arts. Um, so that would be another change. Um, and then we require an additional two courses as, a poor, as opposed to the Mass Corps recommending an additional five courses in core areas. The graduation credits we have um, now are still the same and, and still obviously passing MCAS is the same. So, yes. I would just point out, Downey mentioned that this was all discussed in a curriculum meeting. It actually came to a rules and policy meeting as well because we were going to have to change graduation requirements in our policies. And at that point in time, Nancy Athis recommended that we just not take that action and not try to change the policy because we couldn't afford to add the staff to do the math and the PE requirement. So we just kind of let it go at that point in time. So, but I mean. Thank you, and, and I think that's a great segue to the next slides, which talk about, okay, so if we want to do this, yeah. what will it cost? Yeah. Um, well, and also, I have a question on the sure. last slide. The science is, um, that we have to put on the last side, slide, it says for Mass Core, um, in the thing, the Board of Higher Education Admission Standards requires three, two lab-based physical and natural and does not recognize technology engineering as a science course, and yet down in the science course, we say three courses and more techn technology and engineering. Those are in the additional courses beyond the core, though. Once you satisfy your science requirement, you can take other sciences that don't fall within the three courses that are required within the science department. Right, but the mass core, from what I'm understanding, is that our, we have three courses we can Which take, and, and of that, the choice is technology and engineering of one of the three. If they take those, then if they take that one, then that one is not counted count, by the Board right. of Higher Education. Right, they'd have to take another science course in addition. In addition, so that would be a way of getting, I'm not really sure what it is yet. Well, what that, that technology course like two, would count towards one of your five additional yeah. cores. And towards your science course, because um, in the here, the mass course, there's three courses on the end and it says technology. That's what you're saying. Do, but then, then in the previous page, it says not technology, but in here. So it describes it, it says not technology, and then here where we are, it says including technology. So I'm, I don't get it. So um, I, I'm not really following you, uh, uh, honestly. So I guess I'd have to, I'd have to read it. I'm, I'm right. getting lost on how, how you're saying it. He's talking about, mean? I think, so this one here. Yeah, can yeah. we go back to the last one? Core, this one? Seven. It defines it. All right. <coughs> this one. Says one more? Yeah, that. that. Mm -hmm. Actually, the, no, again, the one that describes it. I think that's and three. There we go. That one right there. That one's right there. I have, it changed in 2012. The Board of Education, no, the Board of Higher Education yeah. does now accept science and technology from the Department of Education website. But the Mass Corps is just now being implemented, so it seems to me that, I mean, I don't know when they decided it, but 2012, so that it's changed and not accurate is what you're saying? 
I'm saying it says that, that on their department, there's a question specifically asked on, on the department website that was updated this week, and it said effective immediately in 2012, the Board of Higher Education changed their admission standards to recognize technology and engineering as a science course. Perfect. So, thank you. there's the answer to me. Thank you. She's a good audition already. <laughs> All right, so I think we'll just skip this slide. This slide talks about the courses that <coughs> students take when they're in high school as being probably the most powerful indicator of how they'll do when they're in college. Um, this one, again, um, is the occupational outlook. And it's saying that, you know, <coughs> if we implement the Mass Corps, it's not because we feel that, you know, every kid needs to go to college. We're doing it because we strongly believe that if students are going to be successful and take advantage of the um, opportunities the economy will bring them, they're going to need to have some education beyond high school. Yes. You know, along those lines, I was just thinking that you know, part of the problem with the Mass Corps is that it's assuming that every student should be essentially qualified for every college or something like that. I was thinking about the kids who are going to art school or who are going to a music conservatory or something like that, where they'll almost certainly have to have some of all of the sort of liberal arts and sciences on their transcript, but not as much as Mass Corps is saying. And vice versa, you know, to be in liberal arts college is really good if you have some fine arts on your transcript. Uh, you don't need to have as much as if you're applying to a conservatory. And um, so the real, I guess it comes down to should we be, shouldn't we only be offering courses which, you know, will prepare kids for what is going to be next out after high school, and assuming that they take courses which will prepare them for whatever is coming next, and that's the only kind of courses we offer, how can they go really wrong? I mean, you know, in terms of, so say they have a balance of more science or less science, well, sure, that'll shape what's open to them, but that could be a positive thing as well. I mean, it, it creates more opportunities in that way. I just don't, I guess I just see the problem of having a, thing that everybody has to take and there's and because again because there's only four years and there's only the you know the eight classes a year it, it you know you're really in a box if that's what you require that's that's what everybody has to take and it doesn't seem as though it actually opens doors to all the other opportunities besides going to whatever the sort of uh, archetypal college is being seen as the goal i think that's probably the biggest con you know, it, it is a much more prescriptive high school graduation requirement, and it um, gives less less um, opportunity for flexibility on the part of the kids to customize a program. Um, I guess what people would say on the opposite side, not that I'm an apologist for Mass Corps, is that the parents who are most successful in um, getting their kids into highly competitive colleges or just colleges are making sure their kids get the mass core classes. Mm -hmm. So isn't it a step in the, in the direction of equity to say, why don't we have all kids take those classes so that then they can decide whether or not they go to college instead of us deciding for them by the classes we let them take when they're in 9th, 10th, and 11th grade. I can, I'm pretty. You hear what I'm that. saying. Yeah, but we have, you know, I've got 65, 35 split. I would probably argue besides the PE, most of those 65% of the kids are probably me meeting um, yeah. Mass Corps. I would think and so. Then, and you know, and so get, then it gets into that other 35. What are we, <coughs> either through not encouraging it, through not pushing it, from not requiring it, are we regulating those kids to, you're not good enough, or you shouldn't try that foreign language, or you know what, because we don't have an art requirement, don't go into art. Or go into art because that's less rigorous than that, that math. You've, got, you've gotten out, you know what? You've capped out at geometry, man. You're done. Right. Of, well, no, so of, that's what I guess what I was saying about shouldn't all of our courses be rigorous as a, and, and have the same standard as opposed to making it be that the sorting is between more and less rigorous. Shouldn't it be equally rigorous but in different pursuits? In other words, viewing, it, viewing our, our course offerings that way. Because I mean, I think a lot of what the Mass Corps is basically saying is these are the rigorous things, and they're, but they're divided up by subject matter, mm -hmm. as though science is necessarily rigorous, which is just not true. You know, you can take the physics for dummies, or you can take the, you know, I mean, those courses are offered in every college. Mm -hmm. Doesn't it depend, too, on what you classify as 
for instance, a math or a science or whatever. So if somebody doesn't want to take the classic idea of math, we may, and they may want to be more creative, we may be able to call something that's more creative math um, instead of just the regular math curriculum that they normally get now. I guess, so what I'm saying is, I think you could expand and, and catch more kids by expanding the definition of what is a math class, for okay, example. You have a foundations of math. You have right. You've got a student that struggled in three years of you know, the old sequence of algebra 1A, 1B geometry, and trying to get them to algebra, or algebra 2. Well, maybe they need a foundation to really fill in those gaps. And then maybe you have a, finance, um, um, a staff where you have um, finance. And I think there's ways to meet their needs. But by saying you have to take four years or, or take a math in your senior year, that's not a bad thing. Yeah, except, you know, again, I'm just looking at my own personal experience where math is just way too abstract for me. And, you know, making me take another couple of math classes in high school would have just, I mean, I could, I could, you know, fake my way through, you know, in terms of I could memorize stuff and I could get correct answers. So I could have gotten to two more courses of math in high school than I did, but and it would have been, you know, B's or A's on my transcript, and that would have been fine. But I wouldn't have learned a thing in those classes. And that's why I didn't take them, because there was no real you know, learning going on, because it was just too abstract for me. And um, so I, that's why I'm talking about how you know, there's, a, there's, a, there's a problem with this prescription that, no, again, the factory model here, that if we pour this into these kids, that's what they're going to end up with. That's not, I think, always an accurate model. <coughs> I found English language arts to be too abstract. No. <laughs> I, think, I think what's going on over here, though, is that they've highlighted it's whether you limit yourself. I think, I think what Laura said was sometimes young people don't know when they're in high school what it is they want to do. Mm -hmm. And you, you, so you all are comparing the limits of not taking the core courses that you're going to need to get into the four-year college versus limiting your exposure to a breadth of topics, something in which might pique your interest and be the thing that drives you for the rest of your life. So, and, and yeah, if we could just make our kids go to school all day long and we had unlimited resources, we could offer them both, you know? <laughs> And free transportation on top of it, but oh, I, I don't know how we get there, and I think that it's, I think, unfortunately, I think I believe that it's more important to give them the basis for going to the four-year college and getting the degree that'll give them a job rather than lighting their passion, and I hate saying that because I believe that we are supposed to be teaching a whole child and that making a rounded human being requires offering them alternatives and choices and letting them make those choices based on their own. It might not even be four years school. It might just go into a two year school because it makes <coughs> sense to them, but going to a two year school and having the skill set to really be successful. Right. And don't forget, I mean many students will go to a two year school and they, they take the entry exam for English or math and they're taking a remedial class. That doesn't count for the transfer of college credit over. So we're not doing those students justice if they, if they really want to pursue education and they've done it because it makes financial sense. Mm -hmm. If we're not maybe making it, saying, you know what, we want you to take a math senior year because we think that if you're in high school and you had your last math, you know, your, your sophomore year, mm -hmm. or, or, in the, or, your first, or your first semester of junior, we're gonna let them go a year and a half without any math. I don't know, it doesn't seem like we're really being considered of what their potential is. You know, and I think we have to show that we believe in you by saying we think having a math is an important skill. And if you go to four-year school, great, but if you go to two-year school, we want you to have that skill set, that ability, that you can go there, you can get the A's or B's, and you can transfer that over to four-year state school and get exact credit. And I think that's part of this too. It's not just four years, it's definitely two years. Or even go into a working world, to a job, where they're being expected to have certain skill sets. I guess my point, though, is just whether it's, whether, you know, we're ta he's talking about limiting kids' creativity, but on the other hand, you're limiting their, their options right. if you well, don't. I, both are, I don't think it's either or, because I think you limit people's options if, if you 
are essentially yeah, wasting current, the time with a class that system. they are simply not going to be learning in. I mean, you know, this is not Lake Wobegon. You know, and they might not, no, I mean, it would have been wasting my time teaching the calculus in high school. What it is that you take, and like the new board member said, I don't remember last name. No, and don't forget, right now, not everyone student has to take an art or music, you know, so, so you know, in some ways, this might, this might, you know, create a mechanism for students that kind of avoid or self-select or are pushing different things. So some students, hey, taking that four years of math senior year, that's, that's going to benefit these students. Those other students that avoid the arts, you know, the ones that express and expose, you know, this may push them into that to have an experience and say, geez, I didn't know about the history <coughs> of pop music. I didn't know that I could sing. I didn't know that I liked to, to be in theater or a drama class. Or for our Mr. Uh, Whalen, you know, dynamic teacher like him, taking his photography class. So that might create those avenues for kids to find interest or passion. But knowing well. too much math isn't going to hurt anybody. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it might. So I did. I did a little math. I did a little math. It might make you an hurt. No, I learned it, so and I wouldn't be able to. Just, it. just. So I, I think it sounds like it sounds like when we're looking at the math core requirements, yeah. that we're we're not leaving any room for taking those other courses. But there are 32 units in the high school right. curriculum. That's 20, 22 of them our mass core. Right. That's 31% mm -hmm. that is completely up to you. Mm -hmm. So I don't, you know, I, I agree with you that there are some kids, and if you look at the statistics on what happens economically for you, on average, right, and some people are not going to be on average, if you don't get through a four-year degree, I mean, it's not even two years now. I mean, there's, yeah. if you look at the income, even a two-year degree, you lag, you, the unemployment figure is much higher, and mm -hmm. And, yeah. and the median salary is much lower. And, it, and again, if that's the way you choose, that's the way you choose. And we hope to graduate mature you know, kids who are going to make the right choice for themselves, work, you know, working with their family. But I don't look at Mass Core and see a straitjacket. No, I'm not, I'm not arguing that. What I'm, I'm really saying is I think, really what I'm saying is I think that all the, those, the other 25% um, or something of the schedule needs to be as rigorous even though it's not in Mass Core. I think that the, um, that the, the, the way it's sort of seen is, is Mass Core is the rigorous stuff, and everything inside of it is the non-rigorous stuff. And I think that's, that's I think, the problem, because then it, what it does then is it means that effectively only the people who are really excelling at the Mass Core are really being prepared for the next thing. Because the other people, what, they're get, what we're providing is, is not as rigorous, or at least not seen as as rigorous, certainly. I've never gotten that impression from yeah, from, from the reporting from what goes on in arts programs at the high school. I've never gotten that impression that no. it's in any way less. And that's course about requirements. Right. It's not it's not defining rigor. Yeah. Right. I understand yeah. that. You know, so, so so I mean, what it's saying is they want to see students take four years. Now, some students might that could be four years of honors AP level. You know, other right. kids, it, it, it's more just saying it, it's requirements. I understand. We want, to, we want to see students take four years of math. Most of our students, when they come in, for example, to new integrated math, all our students right now are going to go integrated one, two, and three. So you go that's three years. You can have that done by your sophomore year. So, so, so the mass course, so what the mass course is saying, we want to have four, so that student that typically might who's, who might wrap up their math sophomore year, saying, "Yeah, I'm done with math." Mm -hmm. The expectation is, oh, we want to take another math, and you have to take it at least your senior year. Now, for some students, they'll jump right into pre-calc calculus, trigonometry, statistics, and they, and they navigate they navigate that already. But the ones that don't, now we're obliged to make sure we, we provide a math for them. Maybe it is in the in that realm of pre-calculus calculus, or maybe it's another math that might be something that meets their need for the students like yourself and like me too mm -hmm. that weren't where calculus was a full nine. But what is there a map that you could create that is rigorous but would make sense for that student to either hone skills or workforce? Some students really would benefit from having right. um, personal finance. We get that request from a lot of parents. Mm -hmm. that, that is a map. I promise it's the last thing I'll say. No, sir. Um, um, so I feel like the two-year language requirement could be such an opportunity to reach some of the students um, who wouldn't normally be on the trajectory where they're taking um, college prep classes. 
Um, I don't know, what is the, what, how many students are speaking Spanish as a first language? Suddenly you have a two-year language requirement. You can either use that as an opportunity to have student experts in the classroom leading conversations and using the skill that's unique to them and sharing their culture and, and making them feel like they actually, it's not an issue of intelligence. They're working so hard to overcome that language barrier and seeing their classmates work just as hard to overcome that barrier in the Spanish classroom that's required. Or you can have a heritage class for just uh, native speakers of the language so that they're working on the same reading and writing skills that they're working on in English class and they're actually getting like a double dose of critical thinking and critical writing opportunities. Or you can have them just place out. I think the only thing that might be absurd is to have them required to take now two years of French or something like that. But I, I mean, or even to take, would it, would it be possible to offer a history class taught in Spanish or a Spanish, you know, a Latin American history class where they can get dual credit? I just, I, I see the requirement, I think, oh my gosh, this isn't a simple yes or no. Like, there are so many ways to go about fulfilling these requirements, and some of them are kind of exciting, and some of them I think people are going to be like, no, not another, whatever. So, I don't know. I just wanted to throw that out there. Yes. Yes. I, I know. Just, I love that you said that. The one thing I want to always keep in mind, though, is we do have special ed students, and that having that as a requirement could put some of those students at risk with graduation. So I just want to keep so, that yeah. population in mind, too. So I will address that as a former special ed director in a school that had a two-year language requirement. One of the things that the IEP team can always do is modify graduation requirements. Yes. So um, if we had students who were struggling, let's say, to become proficient in English, instead of putting the burden of trying to become proficient or at least introduced into another language, we would often substitute other classes. Say, okay, you're still gonna have to make the same number of credits, but we will remove the foreign language requirement for you. And that can be done through the IEP process. And the ELL students, do you know offhand that second language would meet the requirement for Massachusetts or would that be a district-wide decision? I think uh, that would be a district-wide okay. decision. Great. Okay, so moving on to how we could, what it would potentially look like. Um, one of the things that I think was said earlier to, tonight is um, that it's difficult to project into the future what it might actually take. <coughs> Please take these as sort of our best guesses because the school is a very complex system and once you start tinkering with one part of it, there may be unintended consequences in other parts of it. But for our best guess, um, the additional math <coughs> class would require an additional math teacher. Um, the foreign language component would require one and a half teachers. Physical education would take three teachers. Um, that's based on the idea that they're taking a full course every year. If we went to an every other day um, PE system or splitting up one of the blocks as we had discussed earlier, we could reduce that cost because every teacher would be able to see twice as many kids. Um, and then the arts is a question mark. On the one hand, we would be requiring every kid to take an arts class, so that might push up enrollments, but then with the other requirements that they need to take, they might be not taking as many arts classes. We're not exactly sure how that would work out. So moving on, um, the other thing is that this would be a requirement if we decided to do it could only be effective for FY19 because you can't change graduation requirements for students while they're in the midst of their high school career, which means there would be an opportunity to build it in over time. So this sort of looks at, as we were trying to imagine, okay, if we were tasked by the committee by implementing Mass Core, what would our annual um, staffing adjustments need to be? So the first year, we would start with an additional half-time language teacher. That would pick up the kids who typically aren't taking a foreign language in the freshman year. In year two, we need to go to a full-time language teacher and bring on two PE teachers. In year three, we'd have to add another half-time teacher for foreign language. And then in the final year, we'd need to bring on the math teacher because that's that's when we would anticipate students would be hitting that, that fourth math requirement in the senior year. 
Um, we'd also <coughs> need another PE teacher at that time because students would, at that point, we'd be supporting every class taking physical education. So our best guess of the cost of implementing Mass Core is, I think that's 267,000. Yes. Um, once we get to a fully funded model, however, that could be less if we went to an every other day PE model. Um, and whether or not we do Mass Core, we're kind of committed to the PE because we're gonna have to do that in order to come in compliance with the law. Yes. I guess I'm a little confused why it would be an additional cost because it seems like if you're taking a language class, that would be instead of taking a class you're currently taking as opposed to an addition to the classes you'd be currently taking. So I don't understand why it's an additional cost. Because we're not sure where those kids are gonna come out of yet. As I said, you know, some of these are question marks and there may be reductions in other areas because they're taking- so It might be a small fraction of a lot of classes so right. as to maintain right. the right. same right. number of teachers. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know where they're gonna go. You know, um, <coughs> you know, again, we don't, yeah, you know, I can also say that right now, our, you know, we're, we're avoiding a certain percentage of students taking foreign language. Mm -hmm. And that's typically not students, they're the students that don't take it for a reason, mm -hmm. okay? Um, my foreign language class numbers are extremely high. Mm -hmm. So you, you, you know, so we're not, so you're gonna have, we're gonna have to start taking a look at the class sizes for that, work and we will need more. To, if we really want to provide an optimum learning environment for all students as well as students that we know potentially gonna need some some extra um, support, you know, having a class of 25, 30 for students that really struggle in Spanish, Fran French, you know, we're not doing them a service. Yeah. So um, right now, and, and we're also offering three languages you know, Latin, French, and Spanish. So where, where are you gonna need another person? I, I, I don't know. So that, that, that point five um, doesn't re represent many, that's only three courses. You know, um, so it, it's, it's a moving target, so it's really hard to flesh out, you know. You know um. Especially in the out years. Yes. Well, I think our, our estimate in the first year is probably pretty accurate, yeah. but then after that, the margin of error grows <laughs> exponentially. <laughs> And it's also similar to you know, what you're saying, allowing, like, you know, the last couple of years, we're not able to offer always, you know, a French five. You know, you know what I'm saying? So if you, if you want to still offer those, we're going to increase more students having to take French two, French three, for example, for the two years. Um, I'm, I'm going to then drain, I'm going to need teachers that are already teaching maybe French four, French five. Do I shut them down to get to two and three? So am I going to need another teacher to add up the levels? Again, they're going to go and fill in holes in classes. Those classes are getting bigger. I need more classes. I'm taking those courses from somewhere else. I have a question on that. Um, when you're talking about <coughs> Spanish or something like that, can that be being taken over at Smith College at that time? And, um, Our current requirements are that you cannot take a class. One, you can only take classes on uh, um, junior and senior year. You can take one per semester in junior year, two per semester of senior year. You cannot take classes at Smith Co College that we offer. Right, and what I'm saying is instead of offering Spanish five, then go only offer up the Spanish three or four, whatever it is. And um, then anyone who goes beyond that will go and well, we save our money there. Well, again, now you're talking, there's, you know, um, access, mm -hmm. there's a great mm -hmm. point average mm -hmm. you're also talking, we have 30 mm -hmm. kids, you know, I'm not sure, I don't want to um, burn the hand of Egypt. You know, so I'm not sure how prepared they would be if all of a sudden we were kind of cutting out things and pushing them. I think what they have. Right, but this whole political thing is all about the college part of the money and the taxes, and that's all the city council and everything else. So I'm not sure, I mean, if we don't ask, I'm, it's not really costing them a lot of money, so that might be something they're doing. I'm we've we've already options. dumped all the Latin students and the German students mm -hmm. and yeah. some I of the others so on this. I think it would be kind of like, that's your job, not <laughs> it, would, it would seem very odd to sit there publicly saying, we're not going to offer this, we're pushing them. You know, yeah. That would just seem very bad for yeah, yeah, it very happy. Happy. I think we need to increase sure the classes. Were right. you taking into account when you did the math that the recommended senior year, was that what you were assuming that they would take it their senior year? Yes. So my next question would be, Brian, you had talked about the schedule that would be, <coughs> for some kids could finish second, uh, after their first semester of their second year of high school, they could finish their math requirement. Yeah, again, because um, currently, currently, you, you with three, um, yeah, typically okay. uh, on the old model, because this is our first year for integrated, yeah, um, the plan will be, um, 
<coughs> sophomore year, mm -hmm. the student should have completed in grade one, two, and three. Right. You, so, you know, at, at some point, with that, yeah. you know, some students will do it, they'll want to boom, boom, yeah. like right in a row. Yeah. Um, some students will, will spread it out. But, but the plan is that at, at the end of your sophomore year, you've done at least your three maps. Sure. I guess my question, my question then is, is that because of MCAS? They need to have completed those so that they know yeah. that all of the stuff they're going to be tested on in 10th grade. Algebra 1A, 1B, and geometry. And you want to have that for the sophomore year in May for the uh, math and Do you think you'd have an uh, increase in enrollment in that mid-level, that junior year, out of that kind of what you had said before is you don't want a year and a half not having a math class and then have to take it? You don't know. That's the question we have. Yeah, Great. It's yeah. It's evolved. Yeah. Thing. It's hard, it's hard to tell, you know, um, because... Well, it's interesting because right now, for example, in, in our current graduation requirements, English is the English is the only thing that we require is based on freshman, sophomore, junior, senior. Yeah. And wellness, we've always said, has been a freshman mm -hmm. experience. Everything else is just taken. You know. Um, so for the for the core here, there's really no years attached to it. Right. You know what I'm saying? Except um, for math. Except for math. And the math, yeah. again, the math is that one that says and one senior right. year. They're not saying the in between stuff. So. Um, how that would do something, I, I, I don't okay. know. And have you thought, uh, <coughs> do you feel like your schedule right now, the block schedule that you have, lends itself to this? Or is that something you're questioning? I, I think, you know, I think that, um, you know, the year-long schedule of seven or eight classes, yeah. you know, for the most part, we're, we're still offering, you know, the amount of classes you've taken no, in yeah. uh, I think the question is that the level um, when you start looking at block schedule, what people have concerns is, do you really have access to everything? Mm -hmm. um, that's a big part of questions. If you had more access, if you had eight classes or seven classes at the beginning of the year, and you, you took them out, would you have a more free-flowing schedule? Mm -hmm. um, and then I think you also get into, you know, length of time of instruction. Mm -hmm. You know, if you have a class of 47 minutes, I'm not sure what the average, you know, if you're in school for six and a half um, mm -hmm. hours a day, and then you add in seven <coughs> classes, then you add in the time for transitions in between, mm -hmm. you know, what is that time loss? So your class, your average class might be 47 minutes. Mm -hmm. You have a kid for 47 minutes, by the time you transition for five ten minutes, you might be talking maybe a solid half hour of instruction versus a teacher that has 30, 85 minutes. And then you kind of, and then you, have, you know, the, you take a little off the top and um, mm -hmm. the back end, maybe it's a solid, you know, 75 minutes, 70 minutes. So we start talking instruction, yeah. quality of instruction, yeah, no, time. Yeah, yeah. So it's, um, I think it's much more dynamic. We have to really think. I think mm -hmm. the schedule in itself that we have would, would meet this. Okay. Yeah, that, that sense. But if you're talking more looking at a schedule in terms of having <coughs> access, there's always, we hear a lot of, we hear a lot of people that like the block schedule, we hear people that question it. Sure. And there's also modified, but it yeah. Modified, yeah. 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 There's modified, yeah. All sorts of modified. Okay. Okay, so I think we met our goal of stimulating some discussion. I guess I, I are your feet tired yet? Yeah, <laughs> standing I'm, there. And I guess I have a better sense of why this initiative hasn't moved yet. Um, I guess I'm I'm still questioning. We don't have to decide now, but whether or not this is something that you want me to work with Mr. Lombardi on trying to implement through our district improvement plan, or whether we should. Um, Set that one aside. That, that's the question that I guess I would ask us to have more discussion on in November by either saying, okay, let's revise the DIP or let's send this to the policy subcommittee so we can look at our graduation requirements. Are, are there two separate questions though? Are you also asking, if we say no to this, are you also asking we still need to change the PE requirements though? Yeah. Yes. We I mean, still so that's need definite. That. Great. Right. Good. So that's not on the table. You know, just looking at these figures, this looks to me like it pretty much eats up the override for the next couple of years and beyond when the override has run out <laughs> and we're still mm -hmm. spending more money. And that's not even considering what other expenses we may have going that's forward. Right. So, it, right. you know, we could, we could hope that the state's going to send us more money, but my, mm -hmm. my experience has been not so much. Mm -hmm. So I, I, this is... I, I, so bad. You know, and it's it's terrible that once again we're making an educational decision because of money, mm -hmm. but I think we have to consider the cost of it, and I, I guess it comes down to creating a t to looking at our priorities again, and Renee in her 
time this evening mentioned that she had spoken with me and she said that something I said in a meeting a long time ago had stuck with her and she really wondered about zero based budgeting and why we weren't why we never did that mm -hmm. and it's because it's very difficult there are some things that we really pretty much have to keep doing and it becomes it becomes an almost an exercise in futility to ask people to go back and look at if you could build it again from the beginning, what would you do differently and how would you put it together? It seems wrong to ask people to go through that if you're not actually going to be able to do then what they said if, and if you don't have the funding. And I think that's been what's been our stumbling block is that we weren't sure we'd be able to afford to provide the kind of education that we wanted to even if we designed it. So, but, but really, that would be the ideal is to be able to go back and say if we could build it the way we wanted it, you know, could we have then afford to do what we're, what we think we want to do? Okay. So it's difficult. So. I just had a quick last comment. Like, the reason that the district was looking at Mass Corps to begin with was the race to the top funding, correct? So, or partially at least, is from what you said. I wasn't here then, but. Um, so my question, I mean, the overall general question would be, why do, what's the benefit of Mass Corps? I mean, is that going to make our students better? Or is that just one model that some people use? The rationale for it, again, I'm not advocating for it, I'm just explaining from the, the perspective of what's good about it, is that it says, if you have a type of education that people who are sort of most savvy about the educational system are obtaining for their kids. Shouldn't you want the same thing for all kids? And so that, that's really the impetus behind it. Okay. So thank you. I'm really glad. Okay, so um, the next. <laughs> The next presentation very enjoyable is, is mine too. Should I just keep going? Yeah, I think you should just. Okay. <laughs> yes. The PowerPoint. Okay. So, MCAS results very quickly. Um, this was something that uh, several members wanted to have a little discussion about. This is not a comprehensive um, discussion of our MCAS results, but it um, is sort of an overview. The um, information tonight is displayed in this. Um, growth and achievement chart, which I think is one of the um, types of data displays that is really overlooked. We heard tonight that um, we heard tonight that when some people look at the data, they don't really see any difference from year to year. It just looks like scores are, are pretty much flatlining. And I think that's because people are looking only at the achievement dimension and not looking at the growth dimension. So on this um, chart, the x-axis shows um, student growth from the low end to the high end, and that is a percentile rating. So no matter how high the achievement could be statewide, some district is always going to be first percent, and some district is always going to be 100 percent. The rating on the y-axis is an absolute rating, so all, and that's achievement against the standards. So every student or every district in the state could be at the top or every district in the state could be at the bottom because the um, up and down access axis does not um, compare districts to each other it only compares districts to the standards a um, couple of other things to point out in this um, chart is the relative size of the bubble is the relative size of the uh, it shows the size of the test takers in the school. So this is one thing that I think you should pop out immediately <coughs> to you. Um, this district's fate really will be determined by JFK in terms of um, where we stand with our overall achievement because they have the most test takers. They have three tested grades, actually, um, and, and they take science as well. Um, science is not included in these charts because science is not tested every year, so you don't have a growth measure for it. Um, and the other thing that I would point out is I, I think that the more I've been doing this work, this sort of simplifies the mission for me. I think of the goal is getting all of your bubbles into the upper quadrant where you have high achievement and high growth 
and analyzing the results in part can be done by looking at how the bubbles are moving over time and seeing if we're crossing over into the, the, um, the upper right hand quadrant. So um, the, the other thing I wanted to say about test scores is to echo something that was said earlier at the first meeting tonight. If we're going to look at them at all, the only reason for doing it is to try to help kids. And um, I think that the way you, one of the ways that you can help kids is by seeing if there are certain schools or certain groups that are lagging behind their peers and targeting them for intervention. So that comes back to the discussion we were just having about our priorities. Well, one of the things this type of a data display can show you is where are the schools that are, need to be prioritized because they're in critical need. So um, with that, you should have a scorecard in your I have packet. A question on that for clarification. Sure. I, I'm just not understanding the chart. Sure. Lower growth of what? Higher achievement. So it would be a lower growth and higher I'm trying to figure out why two are on one and four on the other. What's the lower growth? Growth of what? So every student gets not only a score on MCAS, which represents how close they are to the standard, 240 is the passing grade. They also get what's known as a growth percentile, which compares that student to all the rest of the students in the state <coughs> who've had this similar pattern of test scores in the past. <coughs> so growth shows whether or not you've reached the standard, are you moving towards the standard? Okay, so higher achievement on then is? Higher achievement means your, your score on the test. It means what, how many questions you got right, okay? But you can stay in the passing range and have low growth. You could be so far above it at, you know, the first time you took it that you're really not growing at all. You just keep passing it year after year after year. So the challenge is not only to make sure that students are passing, but to make sure that they're growing. So one of the things people ask a lot about is high achieving students you know, and making sure they're challenged, you can see that in growth. You can see, are they changing from year to year? It also is particularly sensitive to low achieving students because so instead of saying, okay, if student hasn't passed, student hasn't passed, you know, you can say, well, either the growth is good, which means at some point, you know, his growth is gonna intersect the standard and he'll be passing, or the growth is low, which is a real red flag, meaning every year this kid is getting farther and farther away and is very unlikely to ever pass. And then for each school, you also get a, a growth um, measure. The growth measure at a school is measured by the median child. So whichever kid is right in the middle, that, that person's growth gets assigned to the whole school. So thank you for that question. All right, so I have a little, um, Animation here, it's kind of like a weather loop. You'll see each of the last four years repeat three times so you can look at, um, you can look at how the bubbles grow. So this was Ryan Road School opening day. They were blowing bubbles. I thought it was kind of appropriate for this. <laughs> So that was ELA. Next we'll see math. You see that Leeds kind of does the transit across JLA. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually like a moon. It's yeah. Yeah. So if it's not going to stay the same place, then it's not showing it's an eclipse. Close. Yeah, so if you look at JFK, it's one of the, the ones that I pointed out in math, it's like right in the crosshairs of that grid, year after year after year in math, which means it's sort of middle of the road in growth, and it's not getting any higher in achievement. So um, that indicates that we should make it's an, more strenuous or? It's an area of concern, I would say. Okay. Will this be the first year now, this next year, that we'll have test results showing the impact of the new curriculum and textbooks at the middle school? 
Uh, that's a great question because I don't know exactly when they were implemented. But I will find out and I'll report back to you on that. But that, that that curriculum has been in transition over several years, so I'm sure that that's affected their scores over the past years. I don't know if it will, if this coming year's MCAS will test on the new curriculum or not. So if we could move ahead, I'll just sort of freeze the last year. Um, one of the things that, you know, I see here are three schools that are up in this high growth, high achievement quadrant with respect to ELA, and that's the high school, JFK, and Jackson Street. Um, we've got <coughs> one school that's kind of right on the edge of low growth and low achievement, that's Bridge. You know, that's the school that there's been a lot of concern about for a long time. One of the things that, um, you know, every other school is at least above one of the lines, and three of the schools are above two of the lines. Um, but um, Bridge is really kind of sitting on the wrong side of it. And then moving to math, um, again, you see Bridge Street in the low growth, low achievement area. Um, this time, the three schools in the high, high growth and high achievement are the high school, Leeds, and Jackson Street again. And as you saw from the animation, the JFK kind of just sits there in the middle. Um, so. Um, kind of just giving you the, the big picture of what the testing shows. Um, the high school in Jackson Street are really solidly performing schools right now. Leeds is making really good progress. Remember that transit that it does across the face of JFK. Um, math performance at JFK, the, the fact that it's not really changing um, points out an area of concern where I think we should be looking to do some work. And um, Bridge Street is our only school that's low growth and low achievement. So that is the one that, in my mind, really needs to be prioritized for getting kids some more help. It doesn't say anything about Ryan Road there, though. Yeah, so Ryan Road is on, is in both ELA and math, is uh, in the higher achieving schools. Um, and it is improving its <coughs> achievement. The growth is still on the lower end. Um, so what I would like to do is, you know, figure out ways to get those kids growing faster. But knowing that their achievement is at least good um, means that, it, to me, it's not as high of a priority as Bridge Street, which is low both in growth and in achievement. So if you have a student who does really well on, on the MCAS, um, and that sets their benchmarks, so that student right there, the next, like, it's whatever the percent is really high, and then next year, they get it again, they get it high again. It, to the same place, so they're not going to have a growth. So they're now going to be in the lower growth, higher achievement? Not, not necessarily, because they will only be compared to kids who got the same score on their previous test. Right. Okay. So all of those kids, you know, it's true they only have so much room to bump up, but they're not compared to everybody. They're only compared to the other kids who are also in that same okay. tight spot. So none of these are just individual. This, this, this is all year. compared. Yes. So the achievement and the growth is all yes. compared. Yes. So yes. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions or comments? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> 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 yeah, yes. That's what Laura wrote. Yeah, ninth or fourth graders. Fourth graders. It's 2000 and slowly. <coughs> 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 Okay, as we uh, readjust the light, uh, the, we'll now return to the agenda. <laughs> Item H is reports, and we have reports from the Rules and Policy Subcommittee, um, including a first reading and discussion, discussion on a new um, advertising contract policy with KHBE, and a first reading and discussion on advertising in the schools, delegation limitations and restrictions, KHBR. I'll turn to the chair, Ms. Minnick, to explain That's all a mouthful. That. Yes. <laughs> um, to simplify, I think uh, if you read the minutes that we approved earlier in the meeting, you will understand what the suggested changes are to policy KHBR. And it is, first of all, to allow for a discount to uh, 
advertisers who have been with the district more than five years. We had there was some some request from a from a local advertiser who said that, he, that they thought that they could get it cheaper. So you know that other districts were less expensive for their advertising, but we actually not we our superintendent did some research and the um, athletic director and determined that it really that the fees were not less in the advertising costs were not less in other districts in fact we were right in line or lower than most of our surrounding districts that offer the availability of advertising space so we determined that we did not need to change our fees however we did decide that <coughs> to reward longevity that we would give them a 10 percent discount in their fifth year of advertising with us and it that's consecutive years and you know so and so that changes in the in the policy and then the other change was that it stated that um, any any um, content needed to come and be any advertising content needed to come to the school committee for approval and that we assuming that we were to actually get a large number of advertisers that's not something that we need to spend our time doing. So we uh, are recommending from the Rules and Policy Committee that that be changed to delegate that authority to the superintendent so that the superintendent or his designee would have the authority to approve the content of any advertising that goes on the scoreboard. It was, you know, from the minutes you will see that we also discussed some other issues surrounding the scoreboard, but these are the two changes to the policy that are coming before you. And it's coming tonight as informational for your, so that I can present it and explain it if you have any questions. But it'll come back for a vote at a future meeting. Are there any questions for uh, Ms. Minnick or any of the committee members about the policy change? I just had one question about you know the, the, the content restrictions. Um, you know, it occurred to me with the uh, Prevention Coalition people talking, that they would not be able to put an ad on our fence, right? Because that would be advocacy of issues of a social, political, you know. Um, do we do we have any sort of, um, so it doesn't matter who it's coming from, whether it's somebody affiliated with the schools or not. I mean, what is, how does that work? Yeah, I don't know. We didn't <laughs> <laughs> well, but it is it is a concern because I mean I, you know, it, we thought that these restrictions were rather harsh because there are establishments that are restaurants, but it mm -hmm. says bar in the title of the in the name of the restaurant, <coughs> and those people would be precluded from advertising because they can't make any reference to that on the on the mm -hmm. advertising. So. Um, we recognize that there were some some little <clears throat> kind of <laughs> gray areas here, and I agree with you that I, I mean, in our building use policy, we have made exceptions for things. You know, people who wish to do something that is a direct benefit to our students, and then people who are doing something that's direct benefit to our community. Mm -hmm. Those people are given a lesser rate than somebody who's just a private enterprise who needs a larger space and wants to come in and do something in our building those people pay more i would i would be in favor of looking at some way to make this advertising policy say that if it's somebody that's a that's affiliated with the schools themselves or proactive on behalf of our students that maybe those people should be given some leeway and discretion in advertising, but that's going to be a slippery slope, I'm afraid. Exactly. Yes. Or maybe um, we could even take one of those slots and just give it to the school to be able to use to self-advertise and then just, you know, Northampton Prevention Coalition one month or whatever and just have and have it not cost anything for us because it's our board except you re you'll recall that what they're talking about is a large banner that's seven feet long and once you pay for it it's up there for a year <coughs> so we're not changing it out monthly and whoever the advertiser is is responsible for coming up with for, you know for paying with for the production of that banner so it's that's you know it, it's the right idea but a wrong application I'm not sure how we get to the right way to handle it. 
Other comments or questions about the policy? So your expectation <coughs> was to actually take a vote in November, at the November meeting? That would be my okay. expectation. Okay. Any other questions? Um, do you I, I can't remember. I don't believe that we had anyone because this policy has not been in effect long. I mean, the, the advertising potential has not been in effect long enough. So I don't believe that there was anyone who was eligible for the 10 percent disc discount this year so there's not a specific urgency to change the policy with the exception of approval by the superintendent of the content and I'm not sure if we've had any requests for new advertising that hasn't already been and the superintendent just reminded me that we actually have a three reading requirement on policies like this so we'd have to if we were to vote on it in November this would count as one reading because we're having a discussion of it your <laughs> what's that any suspension would, you could suspend yeah, you your rules. You could rule vote suspend your rules. If we wanted to vote in November, or we could do another reading you in December. You could let it go to December. Yeah. Okay. I, and in discussing that particular issue with Laura, I said that I felt that for this committee and for the kinds of policies that come in before us, that that we might want to change our policy on policies to allow <coughs> us to combine steps one and two, so that we only have to have two meetings worth of discussion of something rather than three, which seems like a, a prolonged sort of. It does seem prolonged to me also. However, um, one of the things that we've been working on in the community for the past few years is transparency. And the thing about having three readings for something like policy, it actually gives the, the public more time to come out and say something. So that's the only reason that I can see that I don't really generally like suspending rules. For the policies because I mean unless it's necessary and like you said we don't have to do it quickly <laughs> I think it's more time for them to put off calling us until the last minute <laughs> so. and then they say oh well <laughs> just let it go so, yeah. but, I mean that's something that can be discussed in the rules and policy meeting and then we can make, bring forward a recommendation at that point in time but okay. but for now he's correct it is really three readings so I misspoke and we I, I, I was it was this was one that I wasn't aware of so yeah. okay so we'll, we'll uh, consider this as the first the reading case. tonight, and then we'll um, bring, it, bring it back to you um, <coughs> on your next month's agenda, and then we can figure out where to go from there. But obviously, if anybody has any questions or comments, they can send those to me in the interim. Okay. okay. Um, now we'll move on to the business administrator's report and turn it over to Ms. Okay. The good news this month is we now have the budget showing. City has closed the books and we were able to roll the budget in. So you've got that showing now. Um, bottom line is through this point, we've spent about 11% of the budget. Um, and then you'll see about another 6% of the budget is encumbered, but we're actually in the process right now since the books have been closed of getting all those purchase orders entered. <coughs> so you'll actually see probably a bigger bump in that next month as we get all those purchase orders up to date in the accounting system. That's about it for tonight. Any questions? Uh for uh, the business administrator about that? There hasn't been any, anything freaky yet, right? Yes, you're okay. <laughs> working on those account numbers. I'm getting those down pat. Oh. <laughs> yeah. How has your transition been? I mean, now that you've started and you have to catch up with two sets of books for the year and everything, is everything going well uh, in your position? It's going well. It's the biggest struggle, I think, anytime you change school districts is learning the unique accounting system to that specific city. I mean, the general Department of Ed function codes I'm familiar with, but learning which digit is special ed, which digit of the account code is, which building, learning all that. So I kind of like on the fourth or fifth day, the light bulb began to go on on some of that as I tried to figure out how to do the state report. So um, that report to your question last month is, or is there wood, is actually coming along better than I would have expected at this point. Um, that's where the wood was. Yeah. <laughs> um, the staff in the office has been great with the transition. I mean, obviously they've carried on for quite a while without anybody there. So they've, they've got some expertise too that's really come in helpful too for the transition. Thank you. Okay. okay, the next item is the personnel report. Yep, and the highlights of this for September. Um, we had 11 new hires as well as five new subs that came on board. Um, for separations, we had six people leave the district. Some of those basically happened at the end of summer, probably as they transitioned into other school districts. We also had a number of subs leave the district also. We had one retirement happen in the middle of September. And then we had five promotions or transfers. Four of those were actually people who had been substitutes and moved into permanent positions in the district. Okay. Any questions about the personnel report? I have one question. On the new hires, 
It says Golds ESP at Ryan Road. What's a Golds ESP? That's a special education program. Oh, okay. Thank you. <laughs> Did you have a question? Oh, okay. Thank you. Okay. Excellent. Um, so I guess we'll move now to the superintendent's report. Thank you. In a continuing matter, I spoke with Glenn Kucher about school committee approval of handbooks. Um, <laughs> there, the MASC position is that both the school councils and the school committee should approve the handbooks. And the rationale is that the school councils have the authority to develop handbooks, but the school committee should review the handbooks to make sure that they don't insert items that are contrary to the committee's policies. Um, so um, their recommendation is that we keep the policy the same, have the school councils first ratify, and then we will look at what's ratified and determine whether or not there are any, any things that need to be changed. But it will be, we will be doing that because of our policy and not because of state law. It's not required of us to do that's that. That's right. It will be our choice to create a policy that says we do that. Well, our current policy says we or do that. Or to continue having that's our right. policy. Okay. That's right. So um, given tonight's discussion about Mass Corps, <laughs> um, the next policy that I think we should, uh, I would recommend to undergo revision is the one on graduation requirements, mm -hmm. which will have to be revised no matter what we do. Um, but I, I think we should delay uh, looking at that policy until after the November meeting. Um, when I'm anticipating there may be a clearer direction on whether or not we're adopting all of Mass Corps or just the required additional PE components um, to come into compliance with Mass Law. I have a question on that for the graduation requirements. Is that going to go to a committee? Is it going to go to like curriculum or is it going to go to, is it a rules and policy? Well, we have a policy on graduation requirements, so I would think that it should be rules and policy. Okay, thanks. Um, as has already been mentioned tonight, um, the Northampton Prevention Coalition will be having its annual retreat next Thursday from <coughs> 10 30 to 4 at Smith College. I've included registration information in the committee packet. If any of you are available for all or part of that day, I'd cordially invite you to join us mm -hmm. and to learn more about the work that the coalition is doing to help students make healthy choices. Also um, included in your packets are the capital improvement requests. Um, I know that was a little bit um, Overwhelmed. much, yeah. um, <laughs> but uh, I, I promise we're not going to um, quiz you on the, the cost of tractors, um, but I would like you to know the items that are going to, um, to, the, cap, to the Capital Improvement Committee on behalf of the schools. I would like to um, draw your attention to two items in particular for the first year, which are the, road, the roof repairs at Ryan Roads and Leeds. Um, these requests are made in anticipation of final approval of our MSBA grant request. Um, We've been moving along to the design phase, which is a very good sign um, because we're required to commit up to $15,000 for the design phase. And I think um, it, it would be awkward to, for us to be asked to spend that much money and then say, no, you're not getting the grant. Um, we have Which been- Mean. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we have been assigned James Kolb of James, of Janie Construction Management and Consulting as our owner's project manager, and Gene Raymond of Raymond, Raymond Design Associates has been named our architect for the design phase and hopefully overall project at the, um, of the roofs. So in the capital request, we were, we're requesting full funding for the roofs as is required under the MSB program, MSBA program, but it is a, it is a reimbursement program. So the Northampton's reimbursement rate has not been determined yet. It would not be determined until the time of final approval, but um, a significant portion of the money that's in the capital improvement plan for the roof requests would be refunded to um, the city upon completion or substantial completion of the roof projects. Um, I've also included in your packet the Commonwealth's draft competencies for building foundations for college and career success for children from birth to grades three. So we discussed recommended competencies from nine to 12. The next phase of this, I think, is the recommended, recommended competencies for birth through grade three. Um, this is uh, still 
in the public comment period, and the public comment is open through tomorrow. Um, we Northampton is represented well at the discussions of these policies by Barbara Black, who's on the committee. Um, so I would encourage you to review the document and submit any feedback you might have through the online survey or by contacting Barbara. She's happy to take more extensive comments directly to the board on our behalf. And I'm happy to report, as you may have seen through the, um, the Devil's Advocate Twitter feed, that Wi-Fi is now on at Northampton High School um, and wireless access points and the related materials for the Wi-Fi project at Leeds have been ordered. I'd also like to congratulate the Northampton Boys and Girls Cross Country teams for their second place finish at the MSTCA Bay State Invitational. <coughs> and I'd also like to congratulate Erica Voss on being, select, on being added to the U.S. roster for the FINA World Cup. Good luck to Erica wow. in Tokyo Aaron. and Singapore. Aaron. Aaron. I'm sorry, Aaron. Um, Aaron also, um, I would like to uh, remind everybody that we have no school tomorrow. It's a professional development day, and um, we will all be continuing our work with understanding by design and differentiated instruction. And that's my report. Excellent. Thank you, Thank you very much. Um, we have one new business item, and that is a uh, written request uh, from the Northampton <coughs> Association of School Employees. Uh, and it's a request for impact bargaining around fingerprinting. I know the superintendent was planning to uh, read that into the record and then uh, make a referral to our <coughs> committee. So this is a letter dated September 25th, 2014. Dear Mayor Narkowitz, please accept this letter as a demand to bargain over the impact of the Northampton School District's implementation of the act relative to background checks. As a continuation of the school committees and associations recent efforts to collaboratively and simultaneously bargain with all employee units represented by the association, I respectfully request that we continue to use the same process for this matter. Look forward to hearing from you so that we can set up a time to meet. Sincerely, Julie Spencer Robinson, President. Okay. And I think I'd, I'd like to request a, um, a motion to have this uh, letter and matter referred to our bargaining uh, committee. I'd like to First make time. a motion to move to transfer the letter to the bargaining committee. Is there a second? Second. Okay. <laughs> committee member, that's good. <laughs> yeah, right. That's well Enthusiastically. So. Yeah, that was, that was some enthusiasm. Um, any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, so that's been referred uh, to the committee and uh, we'll await their, uh, their uh, recommendation report back. Uh, future business and meeting dates, uh, we'll be back here again uh, on November 13th, 2014 for our next regular school committee meeting. And uh, I would now entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Is there a second? Second. second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? The meeting is now adjourned.